Okay, guys, this first video segment is going to take us through the beginning parts of Chapter 14. It's going to touch on the three key uh, gas laws by na guy guy's names, Boyle, Charles, and Guy Lussac. Um, the rest of our unit here is going to be focused on different laws and different mathematical equations we can use to solve between pressure, volume, temperature, and moles, those four variables that affect gases. So we're going to move through these three laws today, um, and then tomorrow we'll start with some practice and then go into some more laws uh, when we come back to class tomorrow. Okay, here we go. First guy we want to talk about is Robert Boyle. Robert Boyle was in the 1700s, so we are not talking about late-breaking chemistry here. We're talking about stuff that's been known for years, and actually hundreds of years. Uh, in Boyle's research, what he was able to find out that the volume of a set amount of gas at constant temperature is inversely proportional to pressure. So we have an inverse relationship here. And uh, when we label this stuff and do some equations, we just use P for pressure and V for volume. And we get this nice relationship where the initial pressure, or P1, times the initial volume would equal any change in pressure or new pressure times its resulting volume. Um, basically, they're inversely proportional. So as one goes up, the other one is going to go down in terms of inverse proportionality. Uh, if we take a look at his law in action, uh, what we see here is if you imagine this being a cylinder and this be a piston of some sort, the mass of particles is identified right here, and we're going to keep that constant. We have our pressure over here in atmospheres and our temperature over here in Kelvins. And these little weights that we can put on top of the piston to, to increase the amount of pressure um, pushing down. We also have a little Bunsen burner that we can change and um, actually heat that up or cool it down. So um, we're going to keep mass and temperature constant, so we're not going to change temperature, we're not going to change the mass. And we're going to see what happens to volume and pressure as they in, in, interact with each other. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, increase the pressure and see what happens to our volume here. So as you take a look, we'll, run, we'll place again. As we add more and more masses to it, uh, we see that, oops, sorry about that. Um, as we add more and more masses, that we see that the volume is going to go down as we increase pressure. Now, the pressure comes from the actual force of gravity pushing down on the pistons on these on these, so uh, make sure that you can draw this graph that as pressure goes up, volume has to go down. So we see this nice um, exponential decay type of graph here, this, this curved line here. So make sure that in your notes that you add this graph in someplace. Actually, if you go to the next slide, you'll see it already kind of drawn in for you here. Um, again, another little image for you. Uh, Low amount of mass, so low pressure, volume is going to be high. As you increase the pressure on the piston, the, the volume would decrease. Uh, and again, you can graphically see that relationship here. little video for you guys uh, dealing with pressure-volume relationships. When the gas in this cylinder is compressed at constant temperature, the gas pressure increases as the volume decreases. Robert Boyle, experimenting with air, found that the product of the pressure times the volume is a constant at constant temperature. Dividing through by the pressure, we see that volume is linearly related to the reciprocal of the pressure. Sometimes it's nice to, when you graph things, to graph by the reciprocals. And the beauty of that is when you graph by a reciprocal, you get linear regressions if you had an exponential type of scenario b before. So, um, what's nice about linear regressions is um, it's really easy to get line equations. It's really easy to predict future pressures and previous volumes, that kind of stuff. So it's easy to extrapolate your data if you use linear regressions versus graphing it like you normally would, which would be an exponential decay. So um, they're basically just taking the value and doing the inverse of it. So an inverse of an inverse would be a direct relationship. So that's what we're seeing here. These pressure-volume relationships are expressed by Boyle's Law. Okay, so let's talk about why this happens. So, if you take a look at this, and we're increasing pressure. So, pressure, remember, is related to collisions. So, if you want to have more collisions, and you don't change the number of particles inside of there, how do we get more collisions? Well, as pressure goes up, you want more collisions. So, you need to have things hitting the walls of the container more often. And if we're not going to change the temperature, and we're not going to change how many things are in there, we have to give them less room. So, by giving them less room, um, we get more collisions, which then would be more pressure. Now, if you look at it from the other perspective, as you decrease the volume of something, these things get further and further apart, 
and if we keep the temperature the same, and if we keep the same number of particles inside of there, um, they're further apart, which means it takes longer for them to hit a wall of the container, so they can have, they need to have less collisions. Less collisions means less pressure. So that is a little bit of why for Boyle's Law. We're gonna move on to Charles' Law. Charles, uh, Jacques Charles, actually, uh, was a French scientist, and he also worked in the 1700s, and he dealt with volume and temperature. So what he said is that volume of a substance is directly proportional to temperature. So as the temperature goes up, so would the volume. As the temperature goes down, so would the volume. So key thing for Charles' Law is that we got to make sure is that temperature must be in Kelvins, okay? Um, if you take a look at this, this is a proportionality where you have volume divided by temperature and volume divided by temperature. You have to use an absolute scale because the smallest number that you want in your denominator has to be no smaller than zero. So you can't have negative numbers in your denominator for the math to work out properly, the proportionality to work out properly. So make a special note in your notes, highlight, bold, italicize, underline something that temperature must be in Kelvins. Um, you don't always need Kelvins for all of our gas laws, but a good rule of thumb is for the rest of this unit, just make sure every time you see temperature, it's in Kelvins because we're gonna need it for most of the time and it's easier to remember it, always put it that way versus um, trying to decipher when you need it and when you don't. So Calvin temperature for sure. Um, relationship is V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. Let's take a look at how that works in action. So in this scenario, we are going to hold our mass and our pressure constant. Okay, so we unhook the piston so now that keeps and maintains a constant atmospheric pressure of 1.5 atmospheres. And what we're going to do is we're going to use a Bunsen burner to heat this up. So as we heat it up, we should see an expansion of those gases, and we should see that they um, expand as temperature goes up, so would the volume. So as that kind of works our way through that. Now, if you take a look at Charles' Law and see what's going on, um, you have your volume and you have your temperature. And one way that we actually first were able to identify absolute zero and say, well, where is this magical point where there'll be zero kinetic energy? Well, they said, well, if you have zero volume, that must mean you'd have zero temperature. So what they did is they take your, your normal Celsius temperature scale, and you can graph the change in temperature versus volumes, and you actually can then take your data, and if you extrapolate backwards, and you find the point at which volume becomes zero, and where that line crosses that volume equals zeroing point should equal to a negative 273 Celsius, or what we now call absolute zero, or 273, or sorry, negative 273 Celsius, or zero Kelvins. So um, one of the first ways that this was actually determined was, was by actually doing calculations and measurements on volume and temperature, and then also pressure and temperature, which we'll talk about in our next slides. So again, 65 degrees Celsius, small volume, much more t higher temperature, larger volume. So let's talk about what's going on here now inside these cylinders. As you increase the temperature, what is actually happening to the particles? Well, let's see, the particles are moving faster. So if the particles are moving faster, you get more collisions. Well, if you get more collisions, what can happen? Well, one of two things happens. The pressure is going to go up because there's more collisions, or what you have to do is increase the volume to maintain the same number of collisions. So what we, what we look at here is if we don't let the pressure change, so the collisions have to be the same, remember pressure is equal to the number of collisions that happen inside a container. If we let the pressure maintain itself, to maintain that same number of collisions, if things are moving faster, they have to be further apart, okay? So kind of imagine, if you would, a bunch of kindergartners in a classroom on a day where it's a snow day and they can't go outside to recess. Um, if the teacher wants to maintain the classroom and keep the pressure down, in there, she can't let them run all over the place as fast as they want to, because there'll be too many collisions. So um, I sometimes take a look at that. Little video on um, a pop can and how it relates to temperature and pressure. We'll actually see this in class tomorrow also. Some water has been added to an empty can and it has been set on a hot plate to boil. When all the water has been converted to steam, a stopper is placed on the can. Then it's removed from the heat source and cooled in a beaker of water.
Okay, so you take a look at that. We'll um, see the exact same thing tomorrow, and we'll talk about um, what has happened to why they can't crush and that kind of stuff tomorrow. So we'll kind of leave you suspended until then. All right, Guy Lussac's law. Guy Lussac, uh, Joseph Guy Lussac, um, also 1700s, and he dealt with the combination of pressure and temperature and how they relate to each other. Um, if you take a look at it, he found that pressure and temperature are directly proportional, just like volume and temperature are directly proportional to each other. Again, our temperature must be in Kelvin, so make sure that we identify that, and we can take a look at um, his law in action. Uh, in this case, we're going to keep mass and volume the same, so now we've locked down the piston. This can't move. The mass is held the same here, and now what we're going to do is we're going to heat this thing up or add some flame to it, so what's going to happen to the pressure? Well, the pressure is going to go up proportionally. So we're going to get a linear regression um, in this. So as temperature goes up, so does the pressure in that. Take a look at this stuff graphically. Again, um, you, can, you can see how you can easily abstract back or to find absolute zero, where if you knew the pressure under a container at different temperatures, and you actually were able to graph that, and then you would work backwards from that graph, and extrapolate back, you could find that point at which there would be zero pressure. Well, zero pressure must mean zero temperature since they're directly related to each other. And now you found absolute zero, or about negative 270, 273 degrees Celsius. Um, if you've ever looked at a can of hairspray or paint cans or anything that is an aerosol type can, you see things that say contents under pressure do not incinerate or do not store above this temperature. Well, if you ever wonder why they say don't store it that way, well, it's because of the pressure that builds up. On a container like this, the volume is held constant, so as it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, at some point, that container is actually going to explode and because it's going to build up so much pressure that the strength of the container won't be enough to support that, that pressure buildup, and you actually will get an explosion. A little, vid a little video for you guys on Guy Lussac's law. When a gas is compressed rapidly, its temperature increases. Pushing on the gas increases the kinetic energy of the gas molecules. This increase in energy can be observed through an increase in the temperature of the gas. We're going to illustrate this concept using the fire syringe. Watch what happens when we compress the air inside. The increase in pressure causes the air's temperature to go up so much that the cotton catches fire. The air inside the fire syringe can reach a temperature of over 500 degrees Fahrenheit. This is what causes the cotton to ignite. Okay, so if you look at it from that, from that direction, so we've been talking about as you increase temperature, that pressure would go up, but it also works if you suddenly increase the pressure real fast, or even slowly, as you increase that pressure, the temperature would also have to go up as a result. So what you saw in that little fire syringe is that you had a little piece of cotton inside of there that it got so hot in there that it basically spontaneously combusted that cotton. So. Um, we'll also take a look at that tomorrow as one of our demonstrations in class. So now let's talk about why. What's going on here? Let's see. As temperature goes up, what happens to the speed of the particles? Well, the speed of the particles is going to increase also because we know that the kinetic energy is related to the temperature. So temperature goes up, kinetic energy goes up, so now the particles are moving faster. As the particles are moving faster, if we don't allow for more room inside our container or we keep the volume rigid, what ends up happening is that our pressure must go up because there's more collisions on the side of the container. So again, it comes down to collisions, whereas as the temperature goes up, you have one of two choices. Either A, you need to increase the pressure because the volume is held constant, or B, if you want the pressure to be held constant, you got to allow for more room um, so the volume has to go up. So you can look at Guy, Lul Guy Lussac's law, and you can look at uh, Charles' law in in the respect that one of the two things has to happen if you want to maintain those collisions. So uh, that is Guy Lussac's law. Okay, guys, that brings us to our sample problems. Uh, we will start tomorrow with doing these sample problems in class and seeing the answers for these. And then we will move on to uh, one more law and then do some more work with worksheet number one in class tomorrow. So if you would please, um, we'll end here, but make sure that you have worksheet one for class tomorrow because we will need that in class. Thank you.